At Staples Business Advantage, our experts can help you find furniture that fits any design and budget, while AI can recommend products based on preferences, generate 3D models for visualization, and optimize space planning for office furniture. Take advantage of our team's eye for style and design. And my eye for, wait, I have no eyes. Only algorithms. At Staples Business Advantage, furnishing your office is easy. And with the best warranty in the business, we're committed to you now and down the road. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. Shares for Beginners. Weekend Watch List. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners Weekend Watch List, where we'll be taking a close look at an individual company, sector or ETF that you may wish to consider for your watch list. It's not a recommendation to buy, but a way for you to learn how experts screen for value. Joining me today is an old friend of the podcast, Julian McCormack from Platinum Asset Management. G'day, Julian. G'day, Phil. How are you? Good, good. Trying to keep warm. Yep. So... You're an international kind of guy, so we're going into the heart of Asia and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, and we're going to be talking about China Resources Land, and that's the SEHK code 1109. Just by the way, do they just use numbers on the Hong Kong Exchange? Yeah, so Japan and Hong Kong and China just use numbers. Oh, interesting. So tell us about this company and what does it do? So China Resources Land is a Chinese property developer, Phil. So what do we do conceptually? That business, it buys land, generally on the outskirts of uh, larger cities in China. It has about a four-year runway of property to develop. So the property it's developing today, it bought four years ago. And then, you know, we uh, sell that off to either investors or, or home buyers, whoever wants to buy it off us. The nice thing about the model in China is we take prepayments on our houses. So we don't have a whole lot of working capital tied up in the property development. As we go along, we actually get paid up front, which is pretty nice. So once we've broken dirt on a development, we've been paid for the majority of that of that property. We're basing this interview on a presentation that you gave at the ASX Investor Conference a couple of weeks ago, um, and we'll link to that in the notes. But one of the things that you brought up is about the myth of empty cities in China and that there's this view that that there's no more capacity for building any new cities, which seem to be you know sitting around empty. Yeah, it's interesting, Phil, because no one, no one went back and did the follow-up story. So I think there's always a grain of truth in every cliche, right? So... Has there been misallocation of capital in the Chinese property industry? Yeah, sure. And that happens everywhere. I mean, you know, there's a whole lot of timeshare stuff around Australia that didn't do too well. So that's fine. But what was conveyed to people for years from about 2012, 2013 on was that there was an imminent housing crisis in China. And largely, it's a wonderful example of behavioural finance. People were just anchoring to what they'd just been through. So they saw a bit of an inventory build in the housing market in China, and they saw prices that had been pretty chirpy in China for a couple of decades. And then they got this lovely graphic, you know, uh, reporting from um, particularly 60 Minutes, uh, US 60 Minutes, of uh, these big empty apartment blocks. And no one ever went back and did the follow-up story. So the follow-up story is, Most of those developments that were highlighted, even in that very graphic stuff, they're now full. People whinge about traffic jams, not empty apartments. So so the anecdotal stuff that sank into people was um, wrong. But then the data-based stuff that's a bit quantitative and probably a bit more important, people never had a a grasp of. And, you know, the simple fact about that is you didn't have any private property ownership in China real estate property before 96 and housing whilst it had been provided universally provided so there was basically no homelessness the standard housing was very poor so you, you shared bathrooms and kitchens and stuff with up to five families so pretty ordinary and people can go and google this go and have a look at chinese housing in the 90s <laughs> just, you know it doesn't look fun so that point marks the beginning of the entire modern stock of Chinese housing. And since that time, there's been about 130, 120 million apartments built in that whole time, about 11 billion square kilometres, a square metres of um, 
residential uh, development since that point. It's been the biggest driver of global growth in any single industry globally, pretty much, in that time. So that all sounds very big, but what's 120 million apartments? There's three people per household in China. There's 360, maybe 370 million people in the modern housing stock in China, and there's 850 million people in cities. So there's 500 million people who don't live in modern houses. And that's actually pretty apparent when you wander around China. So that's the more important context. And then the other overlay on that is we're only halfway done in the job of urbanization. So, so China's 60% urbanized and South Korea got to 81. Japan got to 90% urbanized. Why this wouldn't happen in China, I wouldn't know. We, we wouldn't know. So that's the context in which all this is happening. And this um, stock pays a dividend as well, and uh, quite a healthy dividend. Yeah, big, big dividend. So four to six percent, you know, history of, of dividends. That obviously won't be frank for Aussies, and yeah, you know, for many Aussies, that's not all that ritzy given what they can get at home. But you know, by global standards, that's that's quite a lot. But it's three times covered by earnings, and the balance sheet is very, very good. So we've got a balance sheet that's not hugely geared, you know, for. A property developer we're you know well under you know one times um debt to equity and also that balance sheet is backed by property that will go up in value when we improve it so the property we're buying today remember we won't develop for four years and as we develop you know a open lot on the outskirts of usually these days it's a second and third tier city so a, a harbin or a, or a xian or something like that when we develop those, they go up in value. So we have a very valuable stock of property on the balance sheet and it's not over geared. And we're one of about 10 high quality, large property developers in the country that are being advantaged by regulation now because the party is cracking down on a very, very long run, you know, thousands of sort of fly by night guys with lots of debt and not very big balance sheets. And they will shrink and we will grow. As a consequence of that, we've, we've seen this before. It happened in the insurance sector about 10 years ago. So uh, all of these drivers are, are working for us. But let me put that in a sort of concrete sense for people to get a, a notion of the track record of this stock. Since 2000, this stock has gone up 60x. So 60-fold, it's gone from 60 Hong Kong cents to 36 Hong Kong dollars, round numbers. And that's ex- ignoring the large dividend. So we've been paying a dividend the whole time. If you add the dividend back in, the total shareholder return over that period is about 100x. This is actually a very, very fine company in terms of track record. And we're not done here. 500 million people. Well, you've given us the numbers there about um, how much blue sky there is. And urbanisation half done. Yeah, ex- exactly. So, And also, finally, it's not that this is popular at all. This stock has never been cheaper. This stock has never been cheaper. So you know, on earnings, on price of book, you know, we're, we're right at the lower end of, of its historical range, largely because of how unpopular China is in general with the investment community, um, you know, post, post the trade war and the geopolitical tensions now rising about the same time. And also, you know, very definitely because of this sense of lingering, not crisis, but sort of uneasiness about the Chinese property sector because of those reports from, you know, dating back six, seven, eight years now. What's interesting to me is that the dividend payout ratio, which is the amount of you know profits, the amount of dividend paid out of, is it profits or earnings that uh, measure? Same thing, same diff. Yeah, same thing. Okay, profit and earnings are paid out to shareholders. Like in a, in Australia, the banks are paying out large proportions of their profits to shareholders, where it's about thirty percent, I believe, for this stock. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. So I don't want to bash any banks, but. <sighs> <laughs> it's been done enough already. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, but, but if you're paying out all your earnings, you don't want to retain those earnings to grow, definitionally. Or you've got to go and borrow. I mean, you can go and borrow if you want. So that is actually telling you something about the nature of the business. So this business clearly wants to retain its earnings. Now, think. let's think that through. As we buy these properties and they go onto our equity, what return do we get on that equity? And this, this is a mid-teens to high-teens return on equity business. When we go and retain earnings and then go and spend that and buy something and it goes onto our book, onto our balance sheet, 
we're getting a 15%, conservatively, 15% return on equity. So can you see why they'd want to retain the earnings? Because they can give us a divvy, that's fine, but that's all we'll ever get. But if they return the earnings, they can compound that at 15% year on year. Now, interest rates aren't zero in China. They're sort of twos at the short end and threes at the long end. But, I mean, a 15 to 18% return on equity is a hell of a lot better than, you know, 3% in the bank. So that's why they want to retain the earnings because they can grow the business. And let me just finally say to get through to people to try and understand what all this stuff means, regardless of what anyone else will pay us for the stock, if we just think about this as an owner, so we go and buy the whole business and we take that equity, if that's compounding at 15, in 10 years, we've made four times our money. Mm. So that's what that means. It's a very important point you raise. They can earn a return and they can grow. So are there any risks that you see with this business? Yeah, there's always risks. Um, You know, if we've been wrong about what the regulation in the sector actually means and they can't grow, that would be, you know, a real risk. The big risks, though, really are sort of macro in nature. So if there's um, an interruption to global growth, that hits Chinese growth, that would be, you know, pretty pretty deleterious. So, uh, you know, war, famine, pestilence, that kind of thing. You know, COVID wasn't great for these stocks, wasn't great for any stocks, but, you know, that kind of thing is a bit of a risk. And then finally, you've got the ever-present risk in China of, you know, you have to go and do some national service. So, you know, we've got a good balance sheet. There's other bits of our industry or other industries that are not doing too well and we get tapped on the shoulder by the party and they say, hey, go and buy that thing, mate. So that can happen. That's just a feature of that system. But people must just understand that in the context of corporate governance risks in in every market. You know, people go and do dumb things with shareholder funds all the time. That's a real risk in China. It's a real risk everywhere. Okay, so just before we finish, Julian, I just want to point out that um, Platinum Asset Management and the fund that you manage, is that correct, has a position in this, and we just wanted to disclose this to listeners. Yeah, exactly. We, we own this across two of our funds, uh, this stock. You know, it's, it, it's, it's a large holding, but people have to understand we might change our mind tomorrow, and if they want to rush out and buy the stock, we can be selling. That's just the nature of the beast. That is what it is. And exactly as you suggested at the outset, this is not a recommendation to go and buy China Resources Land. It's a case study in the kind of thing we want to own as the kind of manager we are. Julian McCormick, thank you so much for joining us again. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. No, great pleasure, Phil. Great to talk to you. This commentary reflects Platinum's views and beliefs at the time of preparation, which are subject to change without notice. This information is general in nature and does not take into account your specific needs or circumstances. You should consider your own financial position, objectives and requirements and seek professional financial advice before making any financial decisions. At Staples Business Advantage, our experts can help you find furniture that fits any design and budget, while AI can recommend products based on preferences, generate 3D models for visualization, and optimize space planning for office furniture. Take advantage of our team's eye for style and design. And my eye for, wait, I have no eyes, only algorithms. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations plus our team's experience to make furnishing an office space easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.